Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Here's where it starts to get interesting. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Hmm? Huh? Uh, what do we read back in Deuteronomy chapter 32? God sets the bounds of the people and numbers them according to the number of the children of Israel. How many children of Israel? How many sons? Twelve. Um, what do we just read? Twelve manner of fruits for the healing of the nations. God separated the nations into twelve different boundaries and gave each of them a special inheritance. Uh, what are we supposed to bear as Christians? We're supposed to bear good uh, fruit. What if there are special fruits that are given to you as a Christian when you are in bounds? And dare I say, when you are kindredly pure. What if there are special fruits that God gives? See, so, all oh, this is really stretching it. Okay, then you explain it to me. You explain what it means. And... Uh, by the way, how many elders were there back in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5? How many elders? 24. What's 24 uh, divided by 2? 12. Um, what if the 24 elders are two representatives from each of the 12 nations? And I'll take it one step further. You're really going to love me for this when you integrationists out there. What if the uh, 24 elders are actually kindredly pure couples from each to represent each of the 12 countries that God has created, that God divides? The devil comes in and keeps messing it up and everybody blend together. Oh, let's just all come together. Let's eliminate differences. We're all of one. Don't be a racist. Don't be a bigot. And God's up there saying, don't hate other people, but don't blend with them. I want you separate. Stay separate. Stay separate. Devil messes it up. The Lord goes, smash. And he rebuilds it. Devil comes in again, messes it up. And the Lord goes, smash. I'm going to rebuild it. Wouldn't that be something? Get up there to heaven. And I believe the Bible teaches that we'll be conformed to the image of Christ. I do believe that. You know, and again, that's a whole other study. But the point is, what if there's kindred distinction? You could look like Christ, but still have kindred distinction. Maintain your unique collar. It wouldn't be something if the 24 elders were two representatives from each of the 12 nations. I don't know. All right. Now let's actually get you say, well, this is all just the stuff on kindreds and things. Yeah, but let's actually get into what the Bible says about interracial marriage. And you're going to see how crystal clear it is that God's against it. What about interracial marriage? Well, what were the two first recorded interracial marriages in the King James Bible? Well, the first one would be Lot and then Abram marrying Hamitic women. You say, what are you talking about? Lot goes down to Sodom and Gomorrah as a single man, and he's married when he gets to Sodom and Gomorrah. So naturally, he got his wife down in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's right there. Abram goes and he takes his handmaid, Hagar, the Egyptian, and he has a child, Ishmael. And look at what happened from both of those. Lot ends up drunk in a cave with his two daughters, his own daughters, having children to him, creating the Melobites. I forget the other one, but, you know, basically a, a blending of, you know, very much similar to what, you know, Ishmael would have been. You know, a Hamite and a Shemite together. That's the first two examples of it. And look at what has happened with those different peoples. They've been fighting the Jews ever since. 
Well, God allowed it. God allowed it to happen and things like that. There's a lot of things that God allows to happen that He's not for. And I'm going to show you the clear scriptures where He is against these things. Genesis chapter 24. The devil has had an, an agenda ever since the very beginning of time to mess up what God has made, to destroy God's creation. Genesis 24, verses 1 through 4. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. What a terrible thing for him to say. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. There are no clear scriptures that condemn interracial marriage. You just read one. And there's more coming. A lot more coming. Is it because the Canaanites are somehow lower than pond scum and we should hate them and kill them off? No, absolutely not. They're different. Maintain the differences. Maintain the distinctions. Don't blend what God wants separate. That's the issue here. Genesis 24, verses 37 and 38, you say, well, you know, that was Abraham. He was a racist bigot, a racist railer, Ugh, you know. <laughs> Uh, no, it was actually the, the Lord speaking through him. Genesis 24, verses 37 through 38. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my father's house, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. So he repeats what Abraham, his master, says to him. All right. Now, of course, you have Isaac and Rebekah get married. And who are the sons that they have? They have two sons, Jacob and Esau. And the Lord has something very interesting to say about Esau. Turn your Bible to Malachi, the last book in your uh, Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It says here, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. What did we read earlier about how God sets the bounds of the people and he gives them what? An inheritance? Hmm. What did Esau do? We're going to watch, or we're going to see about that here. But notice it does not say that God hated Esau's sin. We're not going to go there for sake of time, but Romans chapter 9, verse 13 says, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So you can't say, well, yeah, that's just Old Testament. Paul wrote it in the New Testament. You can't duck it. God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. Not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. All right? There are certain people that God hates. But why did God hate Esau? Genesis chapter 25. Let's go back and read it. Genesis chapter 25. Verse 29. It says here, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. Oh, poor thing. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, 
lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. You see, God sets bounds and he gives people inheritance according to those bounds. He says, this land is your land. I designed you for this specific land. You know, I'm a white European, a German by descent. My ancestral type of lands are very cold. A lot of snow, a lot of mountains and things like that. And my ancestry, the Denlinger family, there was a lot of farming, right? I have certain gifts, certain heritage. My wife also farming. German. See? We have certain traits and characteristics and things that work very well with a northern environment. If you're African and you go back, you trace your ancestry back to Africa, there are certain traits and characteristics that you have. You like to work around heat. You like to be in a nice warm environment. Again, if you're Shemitic, there are some things there, you know, and things God has given special gifts to people. And he says, okay, I've set you in the bounds of your habitation. Why? Because I designed you for that area. That's what's going on there. All right? And what does Esau do? Esau comes in and he's hungry. Maybe like some guy gets inheritance of, of 1,200 acres of land or something, and he's got this special inheritance and things, and he comes in and he goes, I'm so hungry. And his brother goes, give me your 1,200 acres, the land that was promised to you, your heritage there your inheritance that the Lord designed for you. Pfft, what good is this land to me? Hey, I want a, a bowl of uh, beans there. You'd give that away for some food? And yet that's exactly what a lot of you are doing right now. You could care less about your ancestry. You could care less about your, your heritage. You don't even care. You look and you say, eh, Germany's being overrun by Muslims. Eh, I don't care. Whatever. Hey, this country's been sold into that, and that country's been sold into this. Who cares? As long as I have food in my stomach. And what did God say about Esau, the man that did that? He hated him. You say, what does this have to do with interracial marriage? I was hoping you'd ask that. Let's continue. So we see that he despised his heritage. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 26, verse 34 and 35. It says here, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. You know what he did? He married two Hamitic people, the Hittites, descendants of Ham. And what did they think about it? What did his parents think about it? Verse 35, which were, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Again, another one of the things that these little weasels, like Brian Moonan and his little followers, his little camp, uh, they'll say that the only reason that God had any kind of thing in, in the past there uh, about people marrying outside of the, you know, the Jews, not marrying non-Jews or whatever, the only reason was because there was idol worship involved. Did you read any idol worship there? Where does it say idol worship? It doesn't. It gives their kindred, their nation, and it says they were upset about it there. It was a grief of mind unto them. No idol worship involved. It has to do with people marrying outside of their kindred. Interracial marriage. Turn next to Genesis chapter 27, verse 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. What did we read back in Genesis chapter 10, I believe it was? Heth is one of the descendants of Ham. Hmm. That's where it came in. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what, shall, or what good shall my life do me? No idol worship involved. She's saying, I don't want my son intermarrying with these people. And look what happens. Chapter 28, verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paden, Paden Aram, to the house of Bethuel, 
thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and multiply, er, excuse me, and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, stranger which God gave unto Abraham. Okay, God made a specific prophecy there where God gives land to Abraham and he says, okay, you might be a stranger in that land, but that's the land I have chosen. Go there. And the Jews are not out of bounds going to the nation of Israel, going to over there to Jerusalem in that area there. They're not out of bounds. That's what God told Abraham he's supposed to have. Verse 5, And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Paden, Padanarim unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paden, Padanarim to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was going to Padan and Rim. Now look at what Esau does. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael. Remember Ishmael being the descendant of Abraham and Hagar? Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took him, took unto, excuse me, and took unto the wives which he had, uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. What a scum bucket, to use the modern vernacular. <laughs> you know, what a disgusting individual. He's purposefully marrying women, interracial marrying, knowing that it grieves his father and mother. That's why God hated him. He despised his birthright, the bounds of his habitation. He despised it, and he went and he did interracial marrying. And God wrote it two times in the King James Bible, I hate Esau. But God's okay with interracial marriage. There are no clear scriptures in the King James Bible to say that interracial marriage is wrong. Are you kidding me? But it gets a whole lot worse than that too, brethren. This subject is not open for debate. It is a clear-cut case. Well, what about, what about, we're going to get to those whatabouts. It's a Bible study. Now, Jacob is renamed as Israel, and he has 12 sons. Let's read an interesting thing here that happens. Genesis chapter 34, verses 1 through 31. I'm going to read the whole chapter here because there's some very important, very interesting things here if you want to get into the interracial marriage slash integration debate. Very interesting things here. Genesis chapter 34, verse 1. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. What does it mean he defiled her? You say, well, he forced himself on her. We're going to see what it really means here, the defiled thing. Let's see about this. But he's a Hivite. He's from Ham. Verse 3. And his soul clave unto Dinah the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel, and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah his daughter. Now his sons were, uh, were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Okay, now that's enough right there for most people. Well, we love each other. You know, as long as people love each other, as long as they're both saved Christians, they're of the same kindred. Ugh, make me puke, you know? I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. Well, we love each other. Isn't that all that matters? Well, that's what you're reading right there. I mean, uh, Hamor goes to Dinah and he says, I love her. My, my soul cleaves to her. We're in love. Isn't that enough? Let's see about this. Verse 6. And again, where's the idol worship at? Oh, it's all just about, you know, when there's, there's a thing about don't marry those people, it's about idol worship. Where's it at? I'll grant you, that's a side effect of what happens. They're different people and things, and they have different cultures and customs to overcome. I'll, I'll grant you that, but it's not mentioned here. Verse 6, 
And Hamor the father of Shechem went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought, wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Interesting. And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you, give her him to wife. Okay, I'm sorry. Shechem was the son, not Hamor. Excuse me. I made a mistake there. Um, now look at verse 9. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And ye shall dwell with us. Everybody coming together. And the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get you possessions therein. Wonderful integrationism right there. Verse 11. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Uh, ask me now, or ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me. But give me the damsel to wife. Oh, they were so in love. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully, and said, Because he had defiled their, Dinah their sister. And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you. If ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then we, we will give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will, we will become one people. They were lying to him. And you're going to see why here. What, what happens? Verse 17. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And the young men deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. And he was more honorable than all the house of his father. He was an honorable young man. He did this thing in integrity. He truly loved Dinah. He was in love with her. You know? Why would they try to fight against this? Let's continue. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein, for the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? You see? There was a little hidden thing on their part too, these heathen, these uh, Hivites. They weren't quite completely honest on their side either. They were lusting after the possessions of, those, of these Jews, the children of Israel. Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. Verse 24, And unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of, the, of his city. Verse 25, And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword, and came upon the, the city boldly, and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain, and spoiled the city, because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep, and their oxen, and their asses, and that which was in the city, and that which was in the field. Now look at this, interesting. Verse 29, And all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives took they captive, and spoiled even all that was in the house. You say, wait a second, they took their wives. Therefore, see, they're, they're intermingling with them. No, they took them as slaves. That's what they did. They went in there and they said, Canaan shall be a servant of servants. These people are Canaanites. We're taking them as our slaves. You want to mess with our sister and defile her? We're going to go in, we're going to kill you, and we're going to take your wives and your children and use them as slaves. So. I, I can't believe you'd preach this. What are you going to do with it? Well, I'll just conveniently overlook that part of the Bible because, you know, this is the kind of thing, brother, I'm worried about you, brother Brian. 
you're preaching some controversial things and this could be the end of your ministry, then let the ministry end. I cannot but speak the things of the Word of God. And if the body of Christ can't handle it, then the ministry's over. Just as simple as that. But I will not lie. I will not tell people that the Bible says things that it does not say. The Bible is a controversial book, and the devil has turned the majority of people against this book and against what it teaches. That's why people say I'm a racist, because they have been deceived by Satan into going against what the Bible teaches. I believe what the Bible teaches. All the controversial stuff, everything in it. Verse 30. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to, take, to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? Yeah. And don't tell me, Oh, it's just about the thing of, you know, they, they, he forcibly forced himself on her. Why write all the other details there? They're mocking the thing of all the people coming together and we can give our daughters to yours and your daughters to us and all this stuff for wives and we'll all be one. They're mocking that. It wasn't just about an inappropriate thing of, of uh, Shechem there coming in and, and you know, basically raping Dinah. It wasn't just about that. It was about her being defiled by another kindred. That's what it was about. Genesis chapter 36, verses 1 and 2. It says here, now these are the generations of Esau, who was Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. And it goes down in there, the Hittite, the Hivite, you know, and things. But look over at verse 12. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, uh, Esau's wife. Interesting. Because you see there, Amalek... Later on, if you read the book of Esther, he's the one that's trying to kill all the Jews. It's almost like every time that they're messing around with the Canaanites and things like that, every time that there's an interracial marriage and children produced, it makes more trouble for the Jews. It makes more trouble, more problems. And the child has to suffer. And that's the sad part of it. I know that there are people that say, you know, I had different people, you know, different kindreds, you know, mother and father are different and things. What am I supposed to do? You know, it'd be, it'd be very similar to me saying, you know, well, before I got saved, I had tattoos. Well, then tattoos are okay because I'm a Christian. God's using me and, and I have tattoos. No, no. I just simply say, you know, I made a mistake there before I got saved. And I don't go out and promote tattoos. If you've been born into a situation of mixed, mixed kin, kindreds, well, there's nothing you can do about that. I realize that. And God's no respecter of person. God will save anybody. I'm not teaching that God won't save certain people and that they're con condemned and cursed and whatever. But don't you go out then and say, hey, God saved me, so he's okay with interracial marriage. Don't go out and say that. Don't take and twist what the scriptures plainly teach. Genesis chapter 38, verses 1 through 10. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chizib when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's fir uh, firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. A mixed kindred child, and he was wicked in God's sight, and God didn't even, God didn't even give him a chance. Just bam, killed him. And look what happens. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and, he came to and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Just bam, like that. 
You see, there are times that God allows sin to happen. Interracial marriage, and a child is produced as a result of that thing. But our text there, God had a lot less grace for the, that son, those sons that came from that mixed relationship. Just because the Bible says, oh, so-and-so, you know, Judah here goes and he marries a Canaanite, doesn't mean that God's for it. Yeah, well, there's no open thing saying that God rebuked Judah for it and stuff. Oh, I'd say it's pretty good right there. God dropped his two sons. No grace for his two sons. Just bam, bam, dead. You better just not mess with other kindreds. God wants you to be distinct. He set bounds of your habitation. He has given you certain inheritance, fruits that are unique to your kindred. Why don't you discover what those fruits are? Why don't you discover what your inheritance is? That's what we're trying to do. That's all my wife and I are trying to say. We're not putting any other you know, kindreds down. We're not saying, you know, Germany and, and everybody else is scum. That's not what we're saying. And not at all. We're saying we want to discover what God has created for us. And I thank the Lord for the German culture and things we're, we're learning and, and we're studying the German language and it's, you know, kind of a long process, but hey, we're studying it and it's a blessing. It's a wonderful thing. Why? We want all that God has for us. You say, what am I supposed to do? I'm mixed kindred. Pray about it. You pray about that. If it's not your fault, it's nothing that you could control, well, pray about it. You know? But again, remember, we're at the end. We're at the end of the church age. And Satan has done his best to mess up God's distinctions again. He's always done that all throughout time. Before the flood, messes up God's plan with man. After the flood, messes up God's plan. During the time of Jacob's trouble, messes it up. During the millennium, at the end of it, messes it up. And God keeps rebuilding it, rebuilding it, rebuilding it, showing that it's his plan to have true diversity. That's what's going on here. Now we're going to get into the really hardcore stuff. Say, I thought this was hardcore. Well, not as hardcore as some of the stuff we're going to be looking at now. Go in your Bible to the book of Ezra. You want to have some uh, stuff going against interracial marriage. Go here to Ezra and then to Nehemiah. Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. You say, see, see? It's just about the religion. They're doing after their abominations. It's just about their religious practices are off. Keep reading. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. No religion to it. It's about the holy seed being mingled. That's what's going on. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. You know where all this integration stuff starts? With the upper class. Let's not judge. Let's, let's all come together. We're all one. You know, don't be a racist. Don't be a bigot. We're all one. Let's all come together. Mm -hmm. The princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And you say, well, it doesn't openly say sin. What do you think a trespass is? Well, let's continue. You're going to see about this. Verse 3, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. They were, then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. Let me ask you a question, Christian. Everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel, do you tremble at this book? Do you fear God? Are you really truly concerned with what this book says? Or do you just say, well, you know, I follow it where it 
follows the modern day course of the world. And where it doesn't, I just kind of say, well, that was for that time. Things aren't that way anymore. Like I did in my other little video, should we update the King James Bible to fit our modern times? Because it's just not politically correct anymore. If you tremble at the words of the Lord, you will say, I'll submit myself to the book and I don't care what it crosses. I don't care if it even crosses me. And you know, I get angry and I start yelling and rebuking people and things like Brian Moonan because he called me, he lied about me, lied about my wife, you know, blurs out my son's face in his video and they say, oh, he was just trying to do that for privacy. He says, oh, I was just trying to do it for privacy. Hey, I put up the video with my son's face. There's nothing private about that, okay? And Moonan puts up his own children's faces and things in his video and he doesn't blur their faces. He lied, okay? Absolutely, totally lied. I don't even want to, I don't, I have no idea what he's doing trying to blur my son's face out, but it was an insult, okay? Maybe he was offended at the fact that we had a little shirt on my son saying, made in America with all German parts. You know, whatever. His little Jesuitical integration thing, you know. You want to keep watching him, go ahead. See what the Lord does with you. But you see there, I get angry and I, get, I yell about this thing and I'm mad saying, look at it, look what they're doing to Germany. It, it disgusts me to think of these Arabs coming over there and defiling German women. It's disgusting to me. Why? I'm not doing anything different than what Ezra did. And yet somehow I'm not right with God and I'm overreacting and getting too radical and stuff like this. I didn't pull out my hair. I didn't pull out my beard. I didn't rip my shirt on, on camera and stuff. Yet Ezra does it. Do you really know God? Do you really know what this Bible even teaches? I know some of you right now are probably seeing this for the first time and going, man, I had no idea. Yeah, I thought the same thing when I saw it for the first time. And I realized I have two options here. I can either pretend that these verses don't exist because the atheists might make fun of me. And they might say, oh, your God's cruel, your God's this. I could either go along with that or I could just simply say, it's written in the Bible, I believe it. I tremble at the words of the God of Israel. The God of Israel. Did you hear me? I said the God of Israel, not the God of the United Nations. I tremble at His words and I'm going to stand before Him someday and give an account for my life. Well, let's continue. Ezra chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken Thy commandments which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an in inheritance to your children forever. Deuteronomy chapter 32. God sets it boundaries, bounds of the people for inheritance that they might bear fruit according to the number of the sons of Israel. Twelve nations. We're seeing it there again. Verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and hast given us such deliverance as this, so do we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there shall be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as, as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. Is that your attitude about integration? When's the last time you fell down on your knees before a holy, righteous God and you said, God, I'm sorry for this integration mess. You say, oh, what are you doing in America? Hey, I left. My ancestors left. And I can't say all my actual flesh and blood ancestors, but my Christian ancestors left our homeland because of Roman Catholicism. We were driven out of there. 
and we came here, but we set up bounds of our habitation here. And we didn't mess with other people and things for years and years and years. I remember my grandmother, uh, uh, May Denlinger, uh, on my father's side, obviously. And I remember she would, she would always be really concerned. Who are they marrying? Who are they marrying? Is it, is it from a good family? And I didn't understand it at the time. I thought she was racist. My grandma wasn't racist. She understood what the King James Bible taught. Interesting. But you see it there in uh, verse 13. Great trespass, evil deeds. What is it? Interracial marriage. It's a great trespass. But look what happens here. This is very interesting. Ezra chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And she Shechaniah the son of Jehiel, Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. You say, well, but, 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 but why would God put that in his word? But, but, but are you saying that, hey, let's not even talk about am I saying or am I suggesting or what's it mean? Why is it in there? You mean God would take such a strong stand that he would tell, literally tell the children of Israel to put away their wives and the children that were born? That's how serious it is before the Lord? Yeah. So these people that come out and call me a racist railer, call me out, oh, you're racist. There's no, there's no condemnation against interracial marriage. Uh... <laughs> Are you blind? Are you absolutely blind? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Jump down to verse 10. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. But the people are many, and it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without. Neither is this a work of one day or two, for we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Let now our rulers of all the congregations stand, and let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at appointed times, and with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof, until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned from us. What did Paul write in the New Testament? The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. What are you going to do with this stuff? You say, well, we're, we're a mixed kindred, you know, we're a mixed couple. What, what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting we get a divorce? Uh, well, that's between you and God. I'm not going to say one way or another. I'm thankful that I'm in the right kind of a relationship with my wife. But uh, you say, well, this is ridiculous. I can't, I can't believe you'd even insinuate. Okay, then show me a place in the New Testament where that's undone. Show me it. Well, I can prove to you that there were certain men that went and they married strange wives. I can prove it, so that means it's okay. Because God didn't strike them down dead, or God didn't this, or God didn't that. Yeah, there's a lot of things that happen in this book that are accounts of man's sin. Doesn't mean whenever you see man sinning that that's now justification for it. Doesn't mean that. And you really need to pay attention to these scriptures here and see what God thinks of interracial marriage. Go down to verse 17. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. And among the sons of the priests that were found that had taken strange wives, namely of the sons of Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, Maaseah, and Eliezer, and Jerob, and Gedaliah. And they gave their hands that they would put away their wives, and being guilty, they offered a ram of the flock 
for their trespass. Okay? And you go down to verse 44. All these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. And it goes down through there, verses uh, 20 down through 43. It lists the men that were guilty of this thing. What are you going to do with that? Oh, well, well brother, but, but brother, you see, you see, you see. God doesn't have any clear things about uh, interracial marriage. Then what on earth did we just read? Turn next to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah 13, verses 23 through 31. It says here, In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, descendants of Ham. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. Integration. That's what exactly, exactly what goes on. Verse 25, And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair. And made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. What a terrible thing to do. What would you think of me if I went up to some mixed kindred couple when I went up and I started smacking their kids around, ripping their hair out and stuff like that? Would you think I was a man of God? Nehemiah did it. Well, I'm just, I can't, I can't believe that it's, it has to mean something else. Okay, then change the text. Change this King James Bible to update it to your lifestyle and see what God does. Brethren, we are in a very, very wicked world right now. As in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days before the coming of the Son of Man. We are in this time and we have to admit that there is sin on a massive scale. It is very bad now. It's worse than a lot of us even can imagine in God's sight. We've been born into this wicked time. We've been born into this evil time and we're just so used to it. We live in the filth. We live in the sewer. But you got to go back and you got to say, what does the Bible say? And you live by the book. That's the issue. Look at verse 26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even, did him, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? You see, in the context there, it doesn't even talk about the pagan beliefs and stuff that these strange wives brought in, these outlandish women brought in. It's talking about interracial marriage. Plain as the nose on your face. You say, oh, you got this from some, some racist southerner or something like this. What does the text say? Just as plain as day. Verse 28, And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business, and for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits. Remember me, O my God, for good. Hmm. I just can't believe it. I just, I just can't believe it. I'm going to cover a couple more things here, then we're going to be done with this study because I know a lot of people already can't handle what I've said. A lot of you are just falling away. I see it. I see it. It just disgusts me. I see more and more people falling away. There are some of you that are faithful that have you've been with me for years and years and years. I thank the Lord for you. You're not going to go against the book. Uh, you've, you've been through enough of this world to know that there's nothing in the world that can convince you to go back. Praise the Lord for you. Uh, the, these rebukes aren't against you. And, you know, I, I love you uh, out there, brothers and sisters in Christ of all kindreds. I love you for who you are. Stay who you are. Uh, celebrate the fact that we're different. Uh, don't become like me. I mean, you know, let me do a little act here for you, okay? From this day forward, I am only going to allow people to subscribe to my channel that wear flannel shirts, that have a beard, and wear glasses. You have to become a Denlingerite or else you are off of my channel. What would you think of that? 
you'd say, well, that, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. Of course it would be. Why? I'm trying to make people that are different just like me. You see? That's really the agenda behind this whole integration thing. Let's all blend everybody together. You take a black man, you take a white woman, and they have children that are mixed. You lose the distinction. Don't tell me you don't. I've known them. I know them. I worked with them. I worked with a black man, had a white wife, and the children were blended. And you know what? Those children are going to grow up. They aren't going to be able to hang out with the whites because the whites are going to say you're part black. They won't be able to hang out with the blacks because they're going to say you're part white. Don't tell me any different. And don't say it's some kind of a problem that we have with each other and we need to get past our racial differences. Nonsense. Nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. Celebrate the fact of who God made you and don't desire to change it. If you do, you're going against God's word. You're going against this book. Turn your Bible to Numbers chapter 12. People say, well, what about Joseph? Joseph married an Egyptian, and he had two sons to the Egyptian woman. Well, Joseph was in captivity. You don't say, well, he was second in command in Egypt. Yeah, but he was put there in captivity. And a wife was given to him. He didn't go out looking for her. So again, you say, well, God allowed the thing to happen. Yeah, God, is, God allows some sin in the world to show that man is no good. That doesn't mean that God is for that. I mean, God would be a total hypocrite if he says, hey, I'm for what Joseph did, but now Jews don't marry with those Egyptians. You see, God's not for it. He gives them clear commandments. Don't intermarry with those people. Don't go get mixed up. And when they do, there are times God says, great. You know, we're going to see about this. What about Ruth, you say? Well, Elimelech and Naomi, they left Israel because of a famine. They should have stayed around. You could say, well, you know, but it's recorded. Blah, blah. Yes, yes, I know. I know all the different uh, arguments and things. Yeah, I know about all that stuff. But you see, they left. They left Israel, and they took their sons down to the land of Moab, and they let them marry Moabite women. And that woman goes in, and she marries Boaz, Ruth. She comes back. She's a Moabitess. She marries Boaz. A Jew. You say, well, that was God's... What, isn't that wonderful? Isn't, shouldn't we celebrate that? No, it was a mistake. They shouldn't have left Israel. They shouldn't have gone down and married daughters of Moab. God has grace. God has mercy. It doesn't mean that he's for it every time it happens. And let me tell you something. If you are married to another kindred, it doesn't mean that God was for it. You say, well, God's used me. God's blessed me and things like this. But not because God is for what you did. Again, are you dealing with the scriptures? Is the scripture your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Or do you just throw out the scriptures when it crosses your life? That's the issue here. And then you have to change the scriptures to make it fit your lifestyle. That is a sin. A total complete sin. But let's look a bit here about numbers, because this is one of the things that uh, little Brian Moonan, the little Jesuit, you know, whatever, coadjutor, basically came out with. And he says, you know, well, Moses married an Ethiopian and God punished, you know, Aaron and Miriam because they were against what Moses did. Let's actually look at what the text says. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down on the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall not behold, or shall he behold. Where, uh, wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And so little Moonan says, See, 
God didn't bring up the fact that he that he married an Ethiopian. You know, if it was such an evil thing to integrate, you know, have interracial marriage, why didn't God bring it up? Because God couldn't bring it up. He said, what are you talking about? God had chosen Moses for a very specific task. He was God's man that God was using. Moses sinned. But Aaron and Miriam were waiting for him to sin so they could try to take his position. There was pride involved. So instead of, if Aaron and Miriam would have just shut their stupid mouths and said, Lord, isn't this wrong? This is kind of bad. This, I mean, this is going to make the children of Israel look very bad. And whatever. God would have dealt with Moses himself. But them stepping in between and saying, look, Moses sinned. Now it's our turn to take over. God had to rebuke them for their pride. And Moses goes on, by the way, to sin later on by smiting the rock. Maybe it was because he had a nagging wife. We need water. We need water. We need water. I don't know. The scripture doesn't say. But the point is to say to use this text to somehow overthrow all of the other scriptures that we've looked at. That's crooked. That's not a saved person doing a thing like that. Uh, it's not a saved person that goes in and cuts people and cuts little bits out and cuts little portions of books and then intersperses it with Ruckman Act and Silly and takes a video of Eric Phelps. I didn't even know what the thing was all about, but Eric Phelps pretended that he was a Jesuit at one point in time just to prove points. Like my wife and I, you know, I dress up like Dr. Smarty Pants. She dresses up like Mother Superior, you know, and we're just, we're just making a point there. We're, we're using sarcasm, you know, and Brian Moonan cuts that and puts it into his video like Eric Phelps is actually a covert Jesuit. You see, it's false information and using Numbers chapter 12 to overthrow all that the Bible says about against interracial marriage is crooked. That text does not prove it. doesn't prove a thing. And another one that's brought up, they'll say, what about Timothy? What about Timothy? Timothy was a result of interracial marriage. And he was. Go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. It says here, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. Uh, why did that even need to be recorded? I mean, if God doesn't care who you marry, why even bother putting that in the Bible? Why? Well, wasn't that kind of racist? I mean, Paul, shouldn't Paul have just seen there are two people that love each other? You know? Why make a distinction? Verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. They knew that he was a half-breed. Timothy was a half-breed. He said, well, that, that's offensive. Then you're offended at God's word. You're not offended at me. Verse 3, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. For they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So before Paul could use Timothy, he said, hey, we got to go get you circumcised. Why? God was totally okay with Timothy just being a half-breed. No, he looked down and he said, you're going to have trouble. And I'll tell you what, there are preachers that don't think about this stuff. There are Christians that don't think about this stuff. And they just say, I, I, I love this person. And yes, we're not of the same kindred, but you know, there's no clear scriptures when there is. And they go out and they get married to somebody of another kindred. And all of a sudden, their children start having trouble. Because they didn't think ahead. You see? And now they have children that don't fit in with this group and they don't fit in with that group. You say, well, that's just because we've had prejudices that have stuck with us for years and years. Well, then those prejudices came from the Bible. Those distinctions come from the Word of God. I just showed them to you today. You see, the devil has been trying, he's been working overtime to turn you against this book. And many people have. And if you've gone through some kind of a 
indoctrination in your past, like public school or university, or even a lot of the Babel buildings out there, you have been indoctrinated into satanic philosophy. And that satanic philosophy, one of them, one of the big ones is integration. And you don't dare speak against race mixing and interracial marriage. How dare you even think it? You, you white supremacist, you racist, you bigot. No, I'm called a Bible believer. And I know that God wants distinction. God doesn't want us all blended together. Are you going to line up with the book? You say, what am I supposed to do? Line up with the book. You pray about it. You say, well, God used Timothy. Yeah, God used Timothy, but not like he could have. Timothy had to live with the sin of his parents. He had to go out into a world and go up to the Jews and they look and they go, yeah, okay, you're going to tell us all about this Jesus and everything else and the Messiah and all that. You're not even a Jew. And he'd go over to the Greeks and he'd say, I'm here to preach Jesus. And they'd say, yeah, whatever, stinking Jew. You're not a pure Greek. His parents didn't think about that. They only thought about their own feelings, their lust. You better think about this stuff. I'm not here to be popular, brethren. And more and more, like I told you, I can see it more and more and more. The nice little, happy little friendly sermons that uh, don't preach the truth. Don't preach those parts of the Bible that offend. Well, if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down fighting. Just as simple as that. I will not compromise the truth of this book. It ain't going to happen. For those of you out there that are supporters of this ministry and that, that believe the King James Bible and you change your beliefs according to what this book says, if you've been lied to, if you've thought that interracial marriage is okay, now you've seen the proof. Now you've seen the scriptures. There's many clear passages before the law was even given. And again, I get called a hyper-dispensationalist. Well, you only listen to Paul. I listen to what goes on before the law. And I apply it to today. Oh, yeah. And this book is crystal clear. Interracial marriage is wrong. And you know what? My son, over here with my wife, listening in. You know, my son, I don't think we're going to be here long enough for him to ever get old enough to, to get married or anything. But if we do, he's going to be told, don't you bring home a woman of another kindred. You say, well, that's so racist. No, it's Bible. It's what the Bible teaches. Why? Because I want him to enjoy the like-mindedness that my wife and I enjoy. I don't want him going and messing around with somebody from another kindred. That's going to be it for this study. Um, please pray for us. Uh, like I said, there's just <laughs> the falling away, you know. And uh, we're going to, you're going to try to preach over there or something? You're too young. You're a novice. You can't even talk yet, so you're not allowed to preach. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, we're going to stand. Uh, that, that's just as simple as it's going to be. Um, the things that I've learned and been assured of, uh, I'm not going to move. I'm going to be stubborn. And... Uh, to, to reiterate it one more time, because I realize there's probably people that have like skipped to the end to see my closing remarks, you know, or something. Has he changed his opinions? You know, I get this thing. That's so funny, you know. We'll accept you back into our little circle if you recant of this or recant of that. I ain't recanting for nobody, okay? <laughs> get that through your head. When the Bible is clear on something, I ain't going to change for nobody, okay? If you're a black brother or sister out there, I love you in the Lord. Okay, you are my brother, you are my sister, and I love you very deeply. If you're Oriental, I love you and the Lord. But I want you to stay distinct from me. Don't all of a sudden show up on film wearing a flannel shirt with a beard and, you know, trying to look like me. No, you maintain your unique characteristics. You learn about your culture. You learn about your customs. You learn and you be what God wants you to be, not what this integrationist, Jesuitical world wants you to be. 
Let's not all come together. Let's stay separate and do the work within our own peoples and not blend. That is going to be it. Thank you for watching.